thank you, thank you all so, so much for that warm welcome, for welcoming me back to Birmingham, this beautiful city, for making this event possible, for letting me come before you and spend some time with you this afternoon. To, uh, to Pastor Price, the clergy on stage, and the members of the storied church, Congresswoman Sewell, my sister in the struggle, one of our strong voices on the Hill. Yes. To the elected officials of this great state, this city, Mayor Bell, you and I have worked together overseas and here, and you, you feel the fight in your heart as well. And all the leaders of this forward-leaning city, to all who've come out today to honor the life and the legacy of Dr. King, to all who work for freedom and equality, I bring you greetings this afternoon from the city of Washington, D.C., a little ways up the road. I bring you greetings from the Obama administration, because we are still here. Yes. We are still here. One of the hallmarks of democracy, as we'd say, is the peaceful transfer of power. And of course, we are working on that transition. But as you know, we also have one president at a time in this country. And until noon on Friday, his name is Barack Obama, and I am proud to serve him and this administration, and always will be, always will be. To my colleague, my friend, my sister, Joyce Vance, thank you so much for that kind introduction and all the work that you have done on behalf of the American people. And to my other colleagues from the U.S. Attorney community, Gregory Davis and George Beck, I thank you for your years of work on behalf of the American people. I am delighted to be back here in Birmingham. I am thrilled to be here. I was here last year, and I was able to meet with so many wonderful people here. And we were talking about the advances and the leadership that Birmingham has shown in one of the most critical issues of the day, police community relations, and it was, it has been an honor to work with you and to hold you up as an example for other jurisdictions that are struggling with this issue and to say, look, Birmingham is working on this and you can learn from them. So Mayor Bell, let me thank you and Chief Roper and everyone who's working on these issues. Such a pleasure to be here. But let me tell you, you know, Mayor Bell, you gave me a little bit of a problem last time. And you and I have talked about this. So Joyce Vance and Mayor Bell and Chief Roper and the sheriffs took us out for a wonderful lunch. Wonderful. And I had to admit, I had to admit it was some of the best barbecue I've ever had. <laughs> now you are probably wondering why was that a problem? Because Birmingham is known for its food in general, its barbecue in particular. Well, you see, I am from North Carolina. <laughs> And we know from barbecue, we just do. So I was at this wonderful restaurant and I, had, I just had to compliment them. I had to tell the chef that it was in fact some of the best barbecue I had ever had. And I said, you know, and I'm from North Carolina, so this hurts a little bit. <laughs> it hurts, and then when he told me that they got their hogs from Smithfield, North Carolina, I said, well, of course, of course. <laughs> so that made it all right. That made it all right. So, <laughs> but if you recall, um, Pastor Price, you were so gracious to give me your time the last time I was here. Also, Mayor Bell was so gracious, and you invited me to come back to Birmingham. You didn't think I'd bring this many people with me, probably. That's what I'm thinking. But, uh, but it is such an honor to be back, and I thank you again for this kind invitation and for this kind welcome. It's an honor to stand before you in this beautiful and this historic sanctuary whose significance to our nation's history, as we have heard, was formally recognized just last week by our president, Barack Obama, who designated 16th Street Baptist Church as part of the new Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. Congratulations. Congratulations. I congratulate you. I rejoice with you. I share your joy that the 16th Street Baptist Church, along with Kelly Ingram Park, will be preserved and protected for generations to come, ensuring that Americans and all who come to learn about America will always know 
of Birmingham's heroic contributions to the civil rights movement. And they will also know that this is a living monument, just as this is an active and a vibrant church. You are honoring the past, but you are also so very much working on the issues of today. And for that, I thank you. I thank you. And we're standing here in this beautiful house of worship, which brings to mind Jacob's words in Exodus. Surely the Lord is in this place. He's in this place. Am I right about it, Bishop? Amen. There we go. Generations of men and women have found the Lord here in 16th Street Baptist Church. You have come here in times of joy and in seasons of sorrow. You've come here to lament as well as to praise, to mourn and to celebrate, to bury and to baptize. You've all come here inspired by the unseen promise of God's kingdom. You know that promise that every valley shall be raised up and every hill made low. Yeah, yeah. And more than that, you've all come here to work. You've come here to work, to do the hard work, the often dangerous work of pushing America to make good on its pledge that all men are created equal. And today, we come here again. We come here again to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We come to praise the God that made his work possible and we also come to work. Yeah. We come to carry on. We come to continue. We come to challenge ourselves to push his work forward. Dr. King labored tirelessly. He obeyed the word of God to advance the cause of freedom. And we also come here to renew our commitment to that work in our own time. And it's not easy work, but it's never been easy. The work of creating a society that respects the rights and affirms the dignity of all people, of all people, regardless of color or creed, gender or ethnicity. That's the dream for which he died, but it's the ideal toward which we must continue striving today. And I think that no place could be more fitting for this solemn occasion than right here, than 16th Street Baptist Church. Amen. 16th Street like just a handful of places in our country. 16th Street has not only borne witness to the progress of freedom in this history, it's also borne the costs of freedom in our history. And now, with this recognition as a monument, you've been recognized as a monument to the enormous sacrifices by which we've expanded and enlarged our liberty over the centuries. 16th Street reminds us, as few places can, that freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. It comes with a price. And the price of freedom is constant vigilance. And 16th Street reminds us that it is up to us, all of us here and now, to ensure that the triumphs of the past remain intact for all the Americans of the future. And of course, many of those triumphs would not have happened without the contributions of this church. When Dr. King launched his landmark Birmingham campaign in the spring of 1963, people came here. Activists assembled at 16th Street to organize, to sing the freedom songs, to declare they would not be turned back by prejudice. They came to work. They came to work, and that's what they did. And because of what happened here in Birmingham in 1963, the nation's conscience was awakened to the harsh reality of segregation. Because of what happened here, the nation could no longer ignore the reality of unjust laws enforced by police dogs and fire hoses. Those graphic images that still resonate today, showing a government literally turning on its own people. And ultimately, because of what happened here, our nation took its most significant steps toward equality since the end of the Civil War by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. These were landmark achievements. These were achievements that people, when they gathered in 1963, did not know if they could gain. They did not know if it would work. But they came to work, and that's what they did. And these achievements changed the face of this nation. 
And thus does Birmingham not only embody the pain of the past, but Birmingham also embodies the power of hope for the future. You are more than the past. You are a beacon of light for that future. When I was born, just a few years before the tragic events in this church, it was unimaginable to think that a black woman could even sit on a jury. You remember those days. You know that's how it was. Much less serve as the nation's chief law enforcement officer. Would not have happened. Wouldn't have happened. But because of what happened in Birmingham in those days and because of the hope that Birmingham brought to this country, I am able to stand before you as the 83rd Attorney General of the United States of America, serving in the cabinet of the first African American president of these United States. Because of Birmingham. Now that progress is real. It is very real and it's remarkable. It is remarkable. It should be a source of pride and hope for all Americans. But Birmingham knows, 16th Street knows, we can't take progress for granted. It doesn't come by happenstance. It doesn't come by chance. It doesn't happen just because we wish and hope for it. We have to what? We have to work. We have to work. We have come a long way, a mighty long way, in our struggle to build a society that is worthy of the promises set forth in our founding documents. But there's no doubt, no doubt that we still have a long way to go, a mighty long way to go. We stand here 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement, after the movement finally put an end to so much of the state-sanctioned discrimination the regime of literally racial violence, violence that terrorized our country for decades. But even so, 50 years after that, we still see our fellow Americans targeted simply because of who they are. Amen. Not only for their race, but for their religion, for their sexual orientation, for their gender identity as well. 50 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we see new attempts to erect barriers to the voting booth. And 50 years after this very church was bombed for its role in the civil rights movement, an unspeakable act of malice that took four angels, we see anti-Semitic slurs painted on the walls of synagogues. We see bomb threats and arson directed at mosques. And as we stand here today in this holy place, we cannot help but remember the tragic shooting in another place of God that claimed nine innocent lives at Mother Emanuel in Charleston in 2015. We can't forget any of that. But we come to work, and work we have. I am tremendously proud to say that under the Obama administration, the Department of Justice has worked tirelessly to meet these challenges. And thanks in part to the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. President Obama signed it in 2009. Since then, the Department of Justice has convicted more defendants on hate crime charges during this administration than at any other time in history. Than ever before. Ever. And we have done that. We have worked on those cases because no American, no one, should feel threatened because of what they look like, where they worship, or whom they love. No one. We continue. We continue to work closely with our state and local law enforcement agencies to improve their relationships with the communities they serve, particularly communities of color, because we know that's where our problems are. And when necessary, we've acted. We've investigated departments for unconstitutional practices and policies. We made announcements just last week in Baltimore and in Chicago. And we've worked with police departments to enact vital reforms because every American deserves to see law enforcement as a guardian, not a threat. And of course, we all know the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County it has significantly curtailed our ability 
to enforce the Voting Rights Act, that does not mean that we're standing still. It does not mean that we are doing nothing while states work to build new obstacles to the polling place. We are vigorously challenging discriminatory state laws in federal courts, and we have won key victories in my home state of North Carolina, as well as in Texas, that have preserved the rights of thousands of Americans to participate in our democracy, because too many have given too much to ensure that every eligible American can cast their ballot on election day. Everyone. Now, I, I could not be prouder of the Justice Department's record of achievement over the last eight years. And I know that we, along with all of our colleagues across the federal government, state and local levels, our partners here in Birmingham, we have measurably improved the lives of countless Americans, and we are proud of that. But I also know that our work is far from finished. And I know that while our accomplishments should make us proud, they must not make us complacent. We cannot stop, we have to work. We have to work. And I know that in our pursuit of a brighter future, we still face headwinds, we still face oppositions, we see it. We see it, the waves of hatred, waves of intolerance and injustice that are still blowing in this country and they seem to grow stronger the more that we achieve. The better we do, the stronger they get. And there's no doubt that we face real and difficult obstacles in our ongoing quest for a more just and united future. But if there's one lesson that we can draw, that we must draw from the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it is that adversity is not a cause for despair, it's a call to action. Amen. A call to action. Action, because we have to work. We have to work. And that was Dr. King's message when he came to 16th Street on September 18th of 1963. Now, three weeks before that day, he had stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and he proclaimed to the world that he had a dream. And all of us here remember where we were that day or what we'd been told about it. We remember that. It's emblazoned in our hearts, a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Yes, standing there in the shadow of Lincoln, people surrounding him, progress there, the dream must have seemed within reach. A glimpse of it there in the diverse and jubilous crowd of thousands, literally thousands of people, who had thronged the nation's capital to affirm that in this country, in America, all people are created equal. And on that day, we know, he proclaimed his faith that we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. That was the goal. That was the dream. Everyone there was there to work, and they were there to make that happen. And his faith, was indeed vindicated by the scene before him. The strains of the sympathy must have sounded sweet. But as we know, three short weeks later, Dr. King came to 16th Street to address a very different crowd for a very different reason. Just days after a bomb had exploded beneath the steps of this church, killing Addie Mae, Carol, didn't die, Cynthia, and Carol Robertson. And I also want to note today that we are joined today by my former U.S. Attorney Doug Jones and Assistant U.S. Attorney Robert Posey, soon to be the acting U.S. Attorney, who know that story because they worked to prosecute two of the perpetrators of that heinous bombing more than 40 years after it happened. They are here today, and they did the work then, because we have to continue to work. We weren't able to bring justice in 1963. We were able to bring it later. That's why we keep doing this work. 
They represent the best of the Department of Justice, and I'm so glad that they're here as well. But of course, on that sorrowful day in 1963, no one knew the future of a case or litigation. People knew the sorrow and the pain of loss. And Dr. King looked out on that crowd of bereaved parents, the grieving congregants. That dream must have seemed much more distant and fragile than just three weeks earlier at the Lincoln Memorial. And I often wonder that, that, that his faith in the American creed must have seemed precarious, because I know that mine would have. I know that it would have shaken me to my core. But Dr. King prevailed in his faith. And in fact, he showed the same determination that he had three weeks earlier. In the wake of that senseless violence, in the midst of that sorrow, he refused to surrender the dream, and more importantly, he refused to abandon his faith, his faith in America, his faith in us, his faith that we could do better. And so he drew a powerful lesson from that loss of innocence. And he said that day, their death says to us that we must work passionately and unrelentingly for the realization of the American dream. And he went on, in spite of the darkness of this hour, we must not despair. We must not become bitter. We must not despair. We must not become bitter. Those are hard words to hear in the face of loss. They're hard words to hear today in the face of anxiety and tension that grip us all. We must not despair. We must not become bitter. And of course, we know the history that five short years later, Dr. King would lay dying, felled by an assassin's bullet. Those were dark days. They were dark days. Now, I don't know if any of you have been able to visit the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, where Dr. King spent his last hours. And if you have, you may have seen that beautiful marker that was installed just below the balcony where he was killed. And you've read the inscription from the book of Genesis, the words of those who were plotting to murder Joseph. And you know that the, it was Joseph's own brothers who were plotting to murder him. Amen. You know that it was his own countrymen who were plotting to murder him. You know it was his own people who turned on him. And that's why that quote is so significant. They said one to another, behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Let us slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Difficult days, yes, and we are in difficult days now. I know that, I know you feel that, because I feel that way as well, and I hear it when I talk to people around this country. Many worry that Dr. King's dream and all that has flowed from it is at risk like never before. And in my travels, I've seen that concern. I've seen the disconnect between the forces of our government and the communities that we serve. I've seen the concerns that the voting booth will be moved out of reach, that our hearts will close along with our borders, and that a prayer in a different tongue or a different posture will place one at deadly risk. And I've seen the fear that once again, we will let a distinction without a difference govern our view of our fellow Americans rather than what is in their hearts. I've seen the fear that with the turn of the electoral wheel, so many of us will be seen as children of a lesser God. I have seen that. I've heard you. But let me tell you what else I've seen as I have traveled this great country. I've seen people speaking out and marching and organizing and gathering in the time-honored tradition that has made this country stronger. That's what I've seen. And in their cries for justice, I've heard their belief that it can be attained. And in our law enforcement partners' quest for support, I've heard the Guardians call for tools to calm the waters, to comfort those who fear, and to know and understand the people they serve. I've seen our young people the heart of any movement, determined to help strengthen their communities and serve a cause greater than themselves, no matter the risk. I've seen them barely old enough to vote, step forward, 
to serve their country. And I've seen our LGBT friends and family members who know for the first time that their government cares for their well-being. I've seen all of that. I've seen the proud faces of immigrants as they have raised their hands to take the oath of citizenship, still believing in this country. I've seen the Stonewall Inn, once a place of persecution and prejudice, now another national monument. And I've seen the newest Smithsonian Museum on the Mall, where at last, black history is celebrated as the American history that it is. I've also seen all my colleagues at the Department of Justice, many of whom are here today, who work all day and well into the night on behalf of people they may never know, in places they may never see, and above all, I've seen all of you, men and women of goodwill, who love this country, who believe in its promise, and who are working to fulfill its founding creed. I've seen your hopes, and yes, your dreams. I've seen your faith, and I have seen your works. And because of that, I have faith in you. That's what else I have seen. Yes, these are challenging times. And yes, we undoubtedly have more challenges to come. But many of our greatest strides in equal rights, in human rights, in civil rights, have come after some of our most heartbreaking losses. This hallowed ground is a testament to that. And my friends, we all know this has never been easy. It's never been guaranteed. It's never been foreordained. It's never been a given that we would have as much as we have today. But over 200 years ago, we decided what kind of a country we wanted to be. And we haven't gotten there. The way forward has not always been on the path called straight. And instead, it's been characterized by twists and turns and sometimes we have even gone backwards. We know we have, but we are Americans and we have always pushed forward. We have always done that. And what we have learned from our challenges, what we know, is not that our values are not true and good, but that every generation must commit to them. Every generation has to work to make them real for the challenges of their time. And now, as I stand before you, my time as the Attorney General of these United States is drawing to a close. But that's all right. To everything, there is a season. Everything. And the lesson that I have taken from Dr. King's life is that the cause of justice is greater than any one of us. It's greater than one person. It spans the temporal boundaries that we would place on it. It transcends the work of a single administration or even a generation. And my friends, I'm here to tell you that if it does come to pass that we do enter a period of darkness, let us remember this. That is when dreams are best made. That's when they come to us. That's when we can find them. That's when we find our dreams. So let us see, what shall become of his dream? Well, now the Lord's already wrought a miracle by bringing us this far. Yeah. And I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Amen. I do not believe he brought me this far to leave any of us. What shall become of his dream? We have to pick it up and carry it forward. We have to work. And we will, we will not shirk, we will not falter, we will not fail. What shall become of his dream? We shall take this newest monument that we're privileged to stand in today. We'll make it a testament, not just to what happened before, but to what we do today and what we will do in the future. We have to work. What shall become of his dream? We'll make it ours. And we will extend it as a bridge to all of those standing on the outside of democracy looking in. And when our time comes, we shall pass that dream on to those who are already raising their hands and to those yet to come. 
so that the arc of the moral universe continues straight and true and continues toward justice. I want to thank you all for welcoming me here today, for hosting me in this beautiful sanctuary, and for letting me spend a few minutes sharing with you what's been on my mind and what's been in my heart. But I also want to thank you for all that you have done and all that you will continue to do to advance Dr. King's dream in our time. I want to thank you for the work that's gone before and the work that I am calling on you to continue again. And I have to say, it has been the privilege of a lifetime to serve as your Attorney General. And I want you to know that as I move on to what Justice Brandeis called the highest public office in the land, that of private citizen, <laughs> I'll still be working. I'll still be standing with all of you as you work. And as we lift up this work, as we lift up this dream, and I cannot wait to see what will become of all of our dreams. Thank you all for everything you've done, for everything that you will do. Thank you so very, very much.